preaching on this morning, so if you'd be so kind, Jerry. If you have your Bibles with you, uh, this morning's reading will be from the book of 1 Samuel, chapter 15, and I will be skipping a few verses, but I'll try and cue you as we go along so you can follow along as well. So we'll begin at 1 Samuel, chapter 15, verse 3. It says this, Now go and strike Amalek and devote to destruction all that they have. Do not spare them, but kill both man and woman, child and infant, ox and sheep, camel and donkey. Skipping to verse 7. And Saul defeated the Amalekites from Havilah as far as Shur, which is east of Egypt. And he took Egeg, the king of the Amalekites, alive and devoted to destruction all the people with the edge of the sword. But Saul and the people spared Agag and the best of the sheep and of the oxen and of the fattened calves and the lambs and all that was good and would not utterly destroy them. All that was despised and worthless they devoted to destruction. The word of the Lord came to Samuel. I regret that I have made Saul king, for he has turned back from following me and has not performed my commandments. And Samuel was angry, and he cried to the Lord all night. And Samuel rose early to meet Saul in the morning, and it was told Samuel, Saul came to Carmel, and behold, he set up a monument for himself, and turned and passed on and went down to Gilgal. Skipping ahead to verse 20. And Saul said to Samuel, I have obeyed the voice of the Lord. I have gone on the mission on which the Lord has sent me. I have brought Agag, the king of Amalek, and I have devoted the Amalekites to destruction. But the people took of the spoil, sheep and oxen, the best of the things devoted to destruction, to sacrifice to the Lord your God in Gilgal. And Samuel said, Has the Lord as great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice, and to listen than, that, than the fat of rams. For rebellion is as the sin of divination, and presumption is as iniquity and idolatry. Because you have rejected the word of the Lord, he has also rejected you from being king. This is God's word. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we're grateful to gather here together to worship you as your people and to come under the uh, study and authority of your word. Lord, we confess that there are portions in scripture that sound very strange and unsettling to our ears, such as the one that we have read here this morning. So I pray, Lord, that you would open our eyes to see the truth clearly, open our hearts to receive your word, and God, help us to think clearly and remember who you are, that you are the creator, God of the universe, and Lord, that you have plans and purposes that are good for mankind. Lord, we are differently than you. We are sinful, prone to wander and go our own way. So Lord, help us to be teachable and humble as we study your word this morning. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, good morning, everyone. I am, uh, I am, this morning, I'm going to talk to you. I'm going to share with you again some of the things that uh, I learned along this time of sabbatical. So this is Sabbatical Reflections Part 2. Um. And one of the things that I wanted to focus in on is this idea of trust. Now, the passage of Scripture that Pastor Jeremy read is just one example that we're going to look at this morning. So, you know, those of you who are like, oh, good, we're going to dissect, we're going to dive right into this and figure out what, what exactly was going on. Well, when you figure it out, let me know, because that story is uh, one of those stories that it definitely has some lessons. In fact, it's always interesting to me about Scripture because the example and it radical and i took some time away i was um uh, christy at one point in time as i shared last week she was sick and so we got to spend a lot of time together for a couple weeks but then there was a time where she was went back to work and um i was kind of on my own and so i went to camp and took the dog with me and we just hung out you know I had some projects to do and things like that, but it was just a great time to think about life and to think about um, 
reflect. And I learned these, the dog runs around and licks their noses. Like they, that's, that's the kind, this, this dog is um, a little too familiar. And she's too familiar with the building. She knows where every garbage can is in this building. Rika is um, a 10-year-old Hungarian Vishla. And they're a hunting dog. Vishla means pointer in, Hungar- in Hungarian. So um, she not only can find birds, but she can also find garbage and just about anything you leave, any crumb that's on the floor, anything like that. And uh, so she can be a handful. When I let her outside, she owns the parking lot. People come up to the building and they're like, do you know whose dog this is? I mean, sometimes she'll be laying. I've had a police officer pull in the parking lot because my dog is laying in the middle of the, you know, the dog's in danger. And out all the time and I don't know if she'd even move. Because this is kind of embarrassing. But And um, so I checked it out. She has, she does get these uh, fatty tumors and so she's got several of those on her body now at 10 years old but but this was really gross different way different felt different and uh it was right on her throat and you know i being the you know pessimist that i am i looked at my wife and i said well she's 10 years old and you know this is kind of the way of life right and so we started it was kind of a somber day because we started preparing ourselves you know, and by the end of the day, we decided we probably would get another puppy. You know, that's how it goes with, with dog people. It's like we can get rid of one and move on to the other before they're even gone. See what I said? You might hate me by the end of this. Cause, but anyway, and so, you know, it made me reflect. It made me think about that. Like, what, well, you know, what is it going to, all the memories, all those things, you kind of get nostalgic and, and you're thinking about those things. And I just thought, you know, how short a lifespan. It's, it's interesting that we have pets and animals and we outlive them. And I think there's some value in that. Because we get to see firsthand that cycle. And maybe we get to see it a few times. Because we realize that at some point in time, we are all going to face a demise. There, there is nobody's, the Queen of England doesn't get out of it, Right? Okay, it doesn't matter how popular you are, it doesn't matter how the notoriety that you have. And it doesn't matter if you are elevated above the people, at some point in time you all will suffer the same fate, no matter what your station in life is. And that's a good thing to be reminded of. Psalm 90 verse 12 says, "So teach us to number our days that we may get a heart of wisdom." That wisdom comes from oftentimes contemplating our own demise. That changes the decisions that we make, the choices and the path that we go on. And and we should let it change that, right? See, we are so busy doing things that we rarely sit down and just think about the fact one day we will no longer be here. Now, some of us might think about it in terms of, you know, our, our children. Some might think of it in terms of legacy. Different things like that. But how many of us are really thinking about what kind of change do we bring to this world? What is it that we can take with us out of this world? I say only one thing. Our neighbors. Our families. Those who we had opportunity to intersect their lives and share the good news of Jesus Christ. Because that's, that's all that we bring to the next life. And really, being reminded of the brevity of life is a good thing because it challenges us to get in motion when it comes to sharing the gospel and to taking a stand for the truth and making sure that people hear the good news of Jesus Christ. I mean, really, when you boil it all down, that's what we need. And you know, this, this message this morning isn't meant to be profound. It's, it's meant to be a reminder. It's meant to be some of those things that we don't think about as we're going through life day after day, doing the next thing, doing things over and over again. We forget, we forget to consider how brief our lives really are. 
And the next thing you know, you get to, in my case, 57 years old, and you're like, what did I really do? What have I done? Is what I have done been valuable? Has it been worthy of a life lived? Or is it just trying to get by? A second lesson uh, that I learned is that one of life's greatest joys is caring for, I, I really struggled with saying this, caring for someone, okay? I want you to understand something. In light of the last thing that I said, I don't think that all dogs go to heaven. I think Disney gives us that idea. I don't see that in Scripture. I know some of you, this is the part again where you're going to hate me. I have prayed with people before because one of their pets died and they wanted me to pray for their pet. I didn't pray for their pet, but I did pray for them because I have compassion and I care. And I, but animals don't have souls and they don't have an eternal destiny. People do. And that's, that's important for us to make that distinction, by the way. Because what happens is, is when our world bombards us with these ideas, then we're not unique anymore. And when we're not unique anymore, then we can treat all humans just like we treat ha animals, and we need to treat all animals the way that humans are treated. And we understand this, humans, people, are created in the image of God. And that's why the Bible tells us that, you know, sometimes what happens in our world, we can see it in Romans 1, that that people begin to crea to worship the creation rather than the creator. And so when we elevate animals above humans, so I, I want to make that clear before we go on, but one of the greatest joys in life is caring for someone. So I, I, one of the things I listed out were a bunch of things that my dog, really, it drives me crazy. I mean, she will find... she. We've spent so much money. We spent money on having corn cobs removed from her bowels. Um, we've spent money on uh, giving the dog uh, some kind of carbon treatment because she OD'd on cannabis. Uh, you're, you're like, it, now how does the pastor's dog get into cannabis? I just told you how holy she was, right? Well, she wanders around this parking lot, and somewhere she picked some up because she came back to me, and she was just a wobbling, and all she wanted to do was eat. And I told, I gave the vet, I gave the vet those uh, actual description of her symptoms, and the vet said, oh, she has cannabis poisoning. I've seen it before. So there you go. It's a thing. Somebody... Somebody was probably uh, threw their stuff out or uh, getting chased by somebody or who knows what, but she ended up finding it because she finds everything. But one of, the, one of life's greatest joys is caring for someone. So in spite of Rika's, uh, you know, her penchant to go and to eat everything that she finds and, and to, you know, cause a whole... She, my dog is a lot of drama. And I have cleaned up and many of you have cleaned up garbage cans around the building that my dog has jumped on and tipped over and spilled, and, you know, I apologize for that. It drives me crazy. And then sometimes she won't even listen. Have you ever, you ever had a kid, like, this is, she's just like a kid sometimes. So she's not human, but she's just like a kid. I will call her and call her and call her, and she'll kind of act like she didn't hear me, which she did, and then she goes off, and then when she knows she can't get away with it anymore, then she squats down and pees, because that's a good thing, you know. It's like, at least I'm not doing that in the house, Dad, you know, so I, I'm okay here. See, I had something to do. You thought I should be doing, but I had something to do. But it still is one of life's greatest joys to take care of something. It's especially that way when it comes to people. I mean, I'm telling you that she reminds me that really my greatest joy and my greatest strength is being able to care for others. And, uh, you know, not necessarily, I'm not saying a dog is a substitute for that. Because one thing I think that brings the greatest joy is caring for people that are on their way to the kingdom. 
those who, or maybe they don't know it yet, but need to know Jesus. That's the kind of caring that can bring satisfaction that lives beyond the grave. And that's what I'm reminded of when I think of the sacrifices that are made and I'm thinking of of all the time and energy spent. That's what I'm reminded of is the fact that that we have this opportunity to be able to um, love people, care about them, see their needs, protect them, and hopefully bring some joy to their lives. Winston Churchill said, we make a living by what we get, we make a life by what we give. And the Bible says in 1 John three seventeen and 18, but if anyone has the world's good and sees his brother in need, yet closes his heart against him, how does God's love abide in him? Little children, let us not love in word or talk, but in deed and in truth. And I believe that this verse here of all the verses really is one of the greatest reasons for this is that when we love other people, God's love abides in us. How many of us want to experience God's love? But when we don't, when we don't care for the needs of others, when we actually turn a blind eye to those, you know, um, and, uh, and close our hearts to those who are in need, well, we find ourselves really bankrupt of God's love too. And really... I mean, if you've been a Christian for any amount of time, or, or maybe even, even the secular world understands this idea. I mean, you see it in, in the writings of psychologists, and, and um, that the fact is, is that, well, in fact, there was a study done where the brain uh, was scanned during times of doing things and helping other people, and, and people were no, or the, the part of the brain that is used is the same part of the brain that, that we get uh, our serotonin levels are boosted, um, that fires off during sex or during uh, new relationships and all these different things. That is all the same part of our brain. So we have the opportunity to be able to love people and care about them and, and really experience the true joy that God intended for us to experience. And that's one of the things I was reminded of. 1 Thessalonians 2.19 Those that we minister to bring us true joy. Paul says this, For what is our hope or joy or crown of boasting before the Lord Jesus that is coming? Is it not you? For you are our glory and our joy. As we rush through life and we're trying to gather stuff and we're trying to accomplish world peace or we're trying to develop the perfect career, get the perfect education, raise perfect children, have the perfect husband or wife, we're doing all these things because we want to have joy. When we're out there trying to avoid you know, the heartache and the hardship of life and and just doing everything in our power to do that, we lose sight of the fact that it's just simply sacrificing ourselves for somebody else. That's what really brings us satisfaction. It really does. You know, I I think of that even in raising children because that's one of the things, like when when we were raising our children, uh, there's a very fine line between experiencing the satisfaction and joy of caring for someone who can't care for themselves, of someone who needs to be served, right? They need to be served. Uh, Of bringing that into their lives, there's a fine line between that and just wanting your kids not to be naughty so that you don't have to feel like, you know, embarrassed at Walmart in the line, right? Or something like that. There's a very fine line between that and and not being embarrassed in life in general. There's a motivation that parents often have. It's like, man, my kids have to get the best jobs or they have to do great things or they have to change the world. And and we forget that our true joy, that that robs us of joy because we're trying to motivate them in the wrong way. 
the truest sense of joy that we get is, is to serve them and to realize that what we do, even though they don't get it, even though they don't realize it, that sacrifice is something that brings us the greatest joy. And so what we do is we avoid it and we become sometimes lazy parents. We try and do it the easy way. We try and just, you know, you ever been in that situation? It's like just... I just got to get through what I'm doing right now. I got this project or I got this thing that I'm working on. Just quiet, just for a minute. I mean, here you go. Here's a big pile of candy. Just leave me alone for a minute, right? And that's, that's, a, that's a wrong motivation. We all know it. Sometimes that's the only way to get it done, okay? I'm a realist here. Okay, baby, don't give your kid a pile of candy, but, you know, you get the point. Yeah, yeah. sometimes you have to pay the consequences. But anyway, so that's one of life's greatest joys is caring for someone. And, and that's what I would challenge you with. Like, ask yourself, how much, do we, how much do we embrace one of the things that can give us the greatest joy of all? And I think one of the things that's interesting about church is, is that, you know, Jim's up here and he comes up and he's like, we've got this need in Sunday school. We've got this other need in cafe. We've got... We need greeters for downstairs. We need all these different things. And people are like, oh, yeah. And, you're, and we're sitting out there. And I, this is the uncomfortable part here, okay? But you're, you're sitting out there, and you're going, oh, yeah, well, I don't really have time. I can't come to church early to greet. and I, I don't like staying late after ca- for cafe. That's, that's hard. You know, and I get it. We all have busy lives. But if we never take any time to serve, then those busy lives just become a burden to us. That's all it does, just mounting burden after burden after burden. So jump in. Get involved. Do things for others. I mean, that's, you know, if you go back to 1 John 3.17, that's an interesting statement in itself. The key to experiencing God's love in our lives is to share not only our time, but in this particular passage where it says that if you close your heart against him who's in need all right and that could be a physical need but it also can be a financial need and if and 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 in this case it says if you have the world's goods and you close your heart to those in a financial need is the assumption there the fact of the matter is is that you lose out on experiencing god's love in your life and so the same thing is true. I mean, some people wonder, why would people give money to the church? Well, here's, here's the answer, because you're not giving it to the church. You're not. You're giving it to an organization, a group of people that help direct those funds in places where the gospel is shared, where, where the Gideons are sharing, sending out Bibles, where we send missionaries to go and represent us, in this country to another country to share the gospel message with people who have much less opportunity to hear it. I mean, one thing about North America, we, you know, we, it's how many people have really, ne- really seriously never heard of Jesus. Think about that. I mean, people have heard of Jesus and rejected him multiple, multiple times over their lifetime. And I don't care if you live in a hole in the ground someplace in North America. You've heard of Jesus. So that's the reason for those things. A third thing, when the storm is over, we take our trust back. When the storm is over, we take our trust back. So trust in the Lord with all your heart and do not lean on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge Him and He will make your straight, uh, make straight your paths. And so there's a passage of Scripture. We all love it. Uh, we all quote it. Um, we've memorized it we probably got it written on something that i'm sure it's on multiple multiple refrigerator magnets even among all of us trust in the lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding and we we love that verse it's like yeah trust in the lord with all my heart and i won't lean on uh my own understanding will we is that true here's the thing uh rika this summer i told you about the growth that was on the side of her neck well she was like, you know, rolling. She started getting tired, first of all, and she was just like lethargic. And we're at camp, and if you know where our camp is, it's four hours from the Sioux if we 
start right now, you know, and, and, uh, and so it's like, are, are we going to take this trip back? We don't know what this is. I don't, you know, she's 10 years old, again, being a little too practical. You can hate me for it, but, you know, um, she's still got some life left in her, but I just don't know. I don't know what, what could be done about it, and we're watching her, and I'm sure if things got really bad, we would have jumped in the boat and headed back, but then she starts, you know, she's just sleeping all the time, and then she's like rubbing herself in the dirt, you know, and digging in the dirt and rubbing herself and rubbing the side of her neck and scratching and started doing all this stuff, and I'm like, oh, man, what is going on? And then all of a sudden she had this this wound, and it starts oozing. And, um, and so uh, we just so happened we had... Uh, you know, even even where we were at, we have connectivity, and so Christy's googling. You know, what could this be, and what can we do about it, and things like that. And so, um, the the solution that we could come up with, with what we had uh, up at camp with us, was to rub salt water on it. Now, I don't know about you, but that did not sound very pleasant to me, rubbing salt water in a wound. But she actually enjoyed it. And, you know, we kept doing it, and, you know, because we didn't have anything else to do. It's kind of, you know, you're just, you're trying to figure out a way to solve the problem. And uh, over, you know, pretty quickly, actually, she started getting, feeling better and getting a little more active, and this swelling started going down, and, you know, anyway, we ended up, I'll just give you the end of the story, because that's not really a part of this, but I know you're going to want to know. So we took her to the vet again, right? So we've been there before. But when we eventually got back and we took her to the vet and everything, and the vet, vet gave her pills for um, uh, an antibiotic, and uh, that's a whole other story. But anyway, she um, eventually, uh, even by the time she saw the vet, it, it, the swelling was almost all gone. She had had an abscess there. Uh, we weren't sure what caused it, if, if there was a wound there to begin with or if she dug it open. Um, but, you know, it all worked its way out in its own gross, disgusting way. And, um, and, and the reason I say all that is because when the storm was over, like she would let us put stuff on that and everything like that. And, and, and then we took her to the vet, and my dog hates the vet. Like I told you, she's a drama queen. And, uh, and so she hates the vet, and the vet gives her pills and gives her shots and all these things, and then I'm trying to give her the pills, right? Well, then she won't take them. I mean, like she took about half of them, and she's supposed to take all of them. And, uh, and she got to the point where she could smell the pills wrapped in peanut butter, and I mean lots of peanut butter, she could smell it right through the peanut butter, and she wouldn't eat it. One time, at one point in time, she bit into it, because then I started shoving them down her throat. I mean, I'm pretty stubborn, too. And so I, I'm, like, pushing them down her throat and stuff, and she's gagging them up and then, and then biting them, and then there's pieces of it. And so I scooped it up off the floor and put it in her dish and put some dog food in there and put syrup on it, and it's all little tiny pieces, and it's all stuck to her dog food right it took her a half an hour to eat the dog food she picked out every piece of dog food ate the dog food and left the little tiny pieces of medicine on the floor right where i picked them up here's the thing if she wasn't sick anymore like she was okay i'm over it i don't have to take pills i don't have to do anything now, I, I might be thinking my dog's way smarter than she really is, but whatever, for whatever reason, that's what it reminded me of, okay? Because that's how we are. We're like, okay, God, I got this problem, and I'm going to trust in you with all my heart, and I'm not going to lean on my own understanding, no way, no how. Now, the doctor said she needed to take all those pills, but... She wouldn't take those pills all the way because she got to a point where now she can lean on her own understanding. She knows better. Now, I don't know if she did or not, so, you know, you get my point, though. The problem is is that we do the same thing. 
as human beings. And so that verse, it means a lot to us when we're going through the storm, but what does it mean to us in everyday life? Because God asks us to do things every day, and then we trust in our own understanding. And that's where King Saul comes in in 1 Samuel 15. Because King Saul, he goes and he's like, Samuel says, God told you, go and wipe out the Amalekites, get rid of them, get rid of everything, don't leave anything standing, anything living, don't just get rid of them all. I don't know why God does that. You know, we can discuss that later on, okay? He's God, I'm not. But here's the thing I do know. God told him to do it a certain way. Saul goes in, well, I'm just, I'm paraphrasing very heavily, goes in, he's like, I won the battle. Look at that. We destroyed them. We got them at our mercy. And the people are all like, hey, we should have a big festival. We should sacrifice their, all these animals and stuff. We shouldn't just kill them like outright. We shouldn't get rid of them. I mean, maybe we can keep a few around and we can do sac- give sacrifices to God and things like that. And Saul's like, yeah, well, I guess I can make that decision for myself because in the beginning, he's numbering the people and trying to figure out, are we going to be able to get through this? And by the end of it, he's leaning on his own understanding. Do you see what I'm saying? God told me to do this, but now I'm going to lean on my own understanding. I'm going to shift gears. I'm going to change the game. And I think that's what... That's one of the lessons, one of the many lessons that that story depicts is how we do that as human beings all the time. I do that. I'm not saying you. I'm saying me. And that's what it reminded me of. It's not to lean on my own understanding. I think this is the kind of thing that's kept many people out of heaven. Because I think that they get in and, and I've counseled with many people in these situations. A spouse leaves, and then they come to me, and they, you know, want to counsel with me. And, and they have this epiphany of God, and, and, and they, they're like, you can just tell. I mean, they're just like, I'm, I'm all in. You know, I want to do this. I want to be involved in this. And, they, and they're a flash in the pan, like Jesus talks about how the, the seed falls on the, the hardened ground, and it, it, it springs up to life, but then the, the sun and the difficulties of, of this life all cause it to wither and die. And unfortunately, that cycle happens over and over. They trust in the Lord until the storm is over. And then they don't trust Him again. They don't ask Him about the little things. They don't follow Him through life. They don't decide that they're going to obey Him because he knows more than we do. And that's something that we got to make sure that we're careful of all the time. And then the last thing, uh, we let fear ruin our lives. We let fear ruin our lives. Isaiah 43, 1 and 2, But now thus says the Lord, He who created you, O Jacob, he formed you, O Israel. Fear not, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by name, and you are mine. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And through the rivers, they shall not overwhelm you. And when you walk through the fire, you shall not be burned. And the flame shall not consume you. Rika hates thunderstorms. What I just said is an understatement. I mean, when she was young, uh, she didn't really care that much. We were driving in my pickup and... um, and she always rides in the front seat. Uh, that's probably some violation of some law or something. I don't know. But she's always sitting in the front seat. And, uh, and we came in my driveway and come up over the hill, and lightning struck the lake right in front of my house or right in front of my neighbors, one in, right in that area. I, I saw it. It was a blinding flash of lightning. My hair stood up. But no, you know, that tingle that you get, and, you know, that all happened. My neighbors, uh, my, my, my kids' Xbox was blown out. Uh, some other electronic equipment was messed up in the house. My neighbor, it literally, the, the lightning strike came up his water line or something and, and burned up his pump. And it was, it was pretty, I mean, it was well known all around. But 
uh, to say all that, the next thing I know, I mean, it's a blinding flash of light, and the dog is laying in the back seat. I don't know what happened to her, uh, if she, you know, just jumped over the seat, or, or if she somehow, I don't know, but anyway. And so ever since then, man, anytime it's lightning, it's like she, firecrackers, somebody shooting at the gun range, I mean, anything, she's like under something. She's in the lowest spot, the darkest spot, no matter what, you know, she just runs for her life. She lives in fear. So much so that as she's gotten older now, when it starts to rain, she starts hiding. And, and even worse, now, two days before the rain, she'll start hiding. I mean, when the barometric pressure changes in a certain way, the do- I know it's going to storm or it's going to rain at least. I know that. Because the dog just, I mean, she is losing her mind. She hates it. And it reminds me that we let fear ruin our lives. That's the worst thing about it. I'm always trying to get, the dog loves to go and chase birds. But man, I'm telling you, if it's raining, I can't hardly get her out of the bed, you know. I, she won't even get up. And I think we're like that a lot of times. Because we're so worried, just like my story about the growth on her neck, we're so worried about that, that we're just like, oh, you know, we're going to live and make decisions based upon our fears, right? I, I, I can't do anything about it. I'm a pessimist. It certainly means the end, doom and gloom, and that's kind of how we live. And oftentimes, it comes to nothing. Oftentimes, you know, even with the barometric pressure change, it, nothing even happens. But there's half a day ruined or a whole day ruined. And that can happen for our lives as well. 2 Timothy 1.7 says, For God gave us a spirit not of fear, but of power and love and self-control. And you know, one of the things that that says right there is that fear loses its power when we actively trust God more than we fear. Right? I mean, when we actively trust God, when we give Him our fears. Now this is what kills us is that when we actively try and fix the situation on our own, what we're really doing is we're teaching ourselves, I've got control. And when we do that, I mean, really, people, do you want control? Do we want control in our lives? We think we do. We believe that's the best. But the fact is, is that if we give it, if we relinquish it to God, that he can take all that fear away. Because now it's his problem. It's not mine. And whatever happens to me, I'm just his servant. End of story. So fear loses its power when we actively trust God more than what we fear. But we set ourselves up for failure when we try to accomplish these things on our own. When we try and fix anything on our own. Without prayer? I mean, certainly... God is going to call us. We've got to ask Him, are you calling me to get involved in this? That's different than taking on everything yourself and then just calling on Him when it's just too big. There's a big difference between those two things. So actively living and walking with Him every day is really the key to making sure that we don't fall into any of these traps. You see, I don't know. I just find trust is is one of those things that trips us up more than any other thing. It really demonstrates how much faith we really put in God every day. And, and you know, we always major on these sometimes minor things, even in our own lives. We're like, oh, i gotta, I got to conquer this, or i got to take care of this, or if I can overcome this, then I'm really a righteous person. And the fact is, is that most of what our problems are stem from a lack of trusting in Him. We can almost whittle down every sin to whether or not we put our trust in Him first. So, anyway, uh, I'm, you know, I'm very thankful that you would be willing to sit here and listen to me talk about my dog. I apologize for that. I am, first of all, not very good at topical messages. I much prefer dissecting God's Word. And uh, we're going we're gonna to get there. 
okay? Don't worry about that. But I just, I, you know, I feel like some of these things are things that were refreshed in my heart. And hopefully this has refreshed you uh, on some of these subjects.